with six, it was our, I believe we were a single resource at the time for the fire four wheel drive engine. And we went to briefing, got our division, got our assignments for the day. And we went up the road a little bit to where we're gonna make our safety zone and burn out that. And that's where we started our day up the road. And we burned that and then we moved on Delventury to the horseshoe where we are now. And the fire was to my right up quite a ways, a few slopes back. And their main goal was to save the horseshoe from burning. After that, we, we said we just waited for our water tender to show up to fill up with water. And then once we got our water, we continued down Delventury and waited for our burn show to start and just support the crews while they burned. It's blowing down. Yeah. It's going to come right yeah. down on Rio Bravo there. Springville Hot Shots, Ops Training. The plan is just to keep supporting the Fulton Hot Shots, and if anything flared up too big, we would cool off that area just so we didn't get any spotting or anything into the green and just continue down the road and let the fire, our burn operation, catch up to the main fire so we could hold it on this road. Then we got a call over the radio for a spot fire that was way back towards the base of that mountain. And there's a creek bed between us and that. So we decided that it was unsafe for the engine to go attack at that time. And then just shortly after that, we got a little five by five spot fire on the side of the road. So we decided to go and engage in the one right off the road. And Roberto, the captain took Sean and Chris, and they were just gonna start walking their way over there and we're gonna meet up with the engine. And I stayed back to turn the engine around. Yo! Once I got him turned around, I jumped up on the step of the engine. Thought about jumping in, but I figured the rest of the crew was walking over there, so I'd go catch up with them. I uh, took off down the road, and I started hearing cracks, and I looked over to the burn side, and a branch was falling out of a tree, and took over the road. This limb that's on the side of the road had fallen off the tree, and shattered me with all of its limbs. That broke. So I kind of, I turned to see it and then I kind of just like went back and sheltered myself, you know, crouched down protecting the head. And when I did that, I noticed that this field is starting to light up really easily. So at that time I was, I had the contemplation, do I go back to the engine now that there's fires breaking off our escape route basically to the engine. And, um, for a second I was thinking, yeah, that's what I'll do. So I took a step back and then I looked up and saw the rest of the crew up there still going towards the spot fire. And that's when I looked back and I noticed Frank covering himself right when the limb fell and hit the road. So as soon as that tree came down and it threw embers everywhere, then this whole side seemed like it was like air ignition and everything just went and all the light flashy fuels were all burning at once at the same time. And that's when everything all the wind started picking up and I remember looking around and sp turning and looking all around me all I see was everything blowing around and the limbs coming down and that's when I felt the all the heat first hit us and at that time I mean the main thing was just our breathing was the hardest part and I remember lifting up my collars on my yellow and just covering myself and my ears and just putting my mouth in my yellows just to get some clean air and just because it's so hard and hard to breathe. The unusual um, thing was um the, the strong winds and branches that came, came flying over us, rocks, embers, just a big old burst of wind that came through and started um, tearing branches off the trees and uprooting um, shrubs and picking up rocks and embers and just rotating around us. So I was continuing up the road and then we had a, a dust devil come right through here, right when I tied up to the crew. It just started throwing really big rocks at us. So we started running down the road away from the engine, trying to get away from the dust devil. And we probably made it to this oak tree right here and started our walk back to the engine. When we, you know, this isn't good you know, for sure, definitely kicked in then. It was definitely time to get out of here. And that's when I saw the rookie, Chris. He kept running. He proceeded down the road. He didn't, he, he didn't hear the captain say, turn around. 
and I, uh, I grabbed the strap that's in the middle of the back on his pack as he was running away because he was running into another oak tree and you could hear him just cracking and falling like this all over the place. So I grabbed him and told him he needed to turn around. And that's the last time I saw him because he turned around and just kept running. And uh, so I finally got straightened out in the road and this was within seconds. All this stuff just happened so fast, it was unreal. Um, the, there's a big lamb that pretty much got plucked right off the tree, and landed in the road and threw I counted them because you can't mistake five spots and little spots just right off the road. And then as I was going towards where the guys were, um, I got on the radio and, and tried to get a hold of Bert and say, hey, there's, you know, you got a spot behind you. And uh, I couldn't really hear, at that time, I couldn't even hear myself talk. It was so windy. It was shaking the truck. Everything was rocks and everything, limbs are flying around, just hitting the truck, and I just proceeded going in. Um, and then as I got to the limb that fell over, I looked to the left of, out in this field here, and it, I mean, within seconds, it literally was area ignition. And I've only seen that once before, and that was from a long ways away. And it, it, I never seen it before like that. So then, so I proceeded past the limb into the smoke and seeing that I couldn't see anything. It was so black and dark, couldn't hear anything besides all the rumbling and stuff just flying around, hitting the truck and just chaos in there. Um, I wasn't getting any response back from Bert and all them, so I, I didn't know exactly where they were, where where they were. So I went down trying trying to get them. I finally got to a point. It was probably about 50, 50 to sixty feet after the the limb that was down back here, um, and that's where I picked up uh, Chris. And I couldn't see him. I almost ran him over. I couldn't see him. He was running out of the smoke because for some reason I got a break in the smoke at that time. And he was running out and uh, he pretty much ran to the bumper, looked at me, I, I could see him, he drool everywhere, just he couldn't barely breathe. And he ran to uh, the passenger, passenger door, door and swung it open and jumped in. And as soon as he opened that door, it felt like someone just turned the oven on. It was so hot, couldn't even, couldn't even explain it. I told him to shut that door and lay down. Um, and first things out of his mouth is uh, get the out of here. And uh, I just kind of looked at him and he's like, where's the guys? And uh, he's all, I don't know, <laughs> they're back there. And uh, I was all, how far? He's all, I don't know. I was all, where'd you leave him at? I don't know. Just get out of here. I was like, where's the guys? And he didn't want to answer me after that. And so I just, I paused there for a second and kind of looked in front of me. It was like driving through Tule fog, can't see nothing. So I couldn't, I didn't know what to do. I had another guy behind with me. And I don't know what's in front of me. And I don't want nothing to land behind me and get me stuck where it burns the truck up and I can't see the guys. I don't know if they went the opposite way that Chris did. I, I had no clue. So I just made a decision there just to back out. You know, it's either I back out and try to save one person at least and get out of there or just try to go in and get, get the rest of the guys and not knowing which direction they went, it's kind of hard to or make a decision like that. I know when we were standing here, like the first thought in my head was it wasn't really happening. I remember, like I said, looking at spinning around and just seeing fire and heat or just things flying through the air and just seeing limbs and you could hear them hitting the ground. And I'm, we were all standing, looking at each other, not knowing what to do and just trying to get out. When we started backing, it was just the winds were so hard that you couldn't move. You try lifting up your foot and you just, it just dropped on the ground. It was so hard to move out of it. It was it was very noisy. I remember I know we were all all three of us at this time 
we're all just right next to each other. And I could look up at Frank and our captain, but you couldn't hear anything. I could see their lips moving, but you just couldn't hear a thing. You know, actually doing a 360, see which, you know, turn one way, see if it was easier to breathe, turn another, and it was all the same. And it's just, just the, the heat, it was just intense in there. You know, hands were burnt, you know, felt embers on my neck. You know, I looked at the pavement and thought, you know, I guess this, this is it. This is it for us, you know. You know, well, you know, what a present, what a present to the family, you know. Right. And after that, I just, you know, just remembered my training and, you know, fire shelter training and, you know, started breathing calmly and taking short breaths and, you know, the guys couldn't hear me and, you know, so, so I just, um, pulled my fire shelter out and showed it to them and, and they followed suit after that. And that's when I could see our captain looking at us and he could be saying something, but I couldn't hear him from like two feet away just because it was so loud. And that's when I saw him grab his shelter and I didn't think twice about it and just grabbed mine and I started deploying it. We saw the captain pulling out a shelter and we just reverted to our training, got the calming effect because we, we trained really hard with the shelters, the practice shelters. and. It, at that point in time, like leading up to that, it was kind of crazy with the with the dust double and everything, and kind of like blown away and panicking almost. And then once the shelter came out, everything was back to routine practice and what our training called for. While I was opening it, it was I thought to myself like I can't screw this up. I know it's, it's extremely windy. I just got to take my time and I thought to myself, I remember seeing both handles and saying right hand, left hand and I took my time just to grab them so I wouldn't lose it and it's so windy. I remember holding it and it just was flying in the air and it was like the hot dog shape, it just wouldn't open. I remember I had to go and kind of peel the side before it kind of blew open. Yeah, I, I mean I came to the conclusion that we weren't going to deploy on the road because during the day, you know, I seen all the traffic that was coming up and down the road, you know, water tenders, um, engines, um, and other f um, fire personnel, and just the stuff that was coming down off them trees, you know. Plus it was, you know, it was smoky, you couldn't see anything, so we had no, I, I, I didn't feel that it was safe, you know. My, my, my deal was to get the fire shelters, put them on, and just start walking out. I was just holding on for my life pretty much because I knew I was getting in it and um, put it around me once I got a hold of it, opened it up and started proceeding with the captain and walking backwards. And I, after that, you know, it was a big, big um, relief, you know, I was able to breathe, you know, feel all that cool air underneath that fire shelter. I thought that we are going to make it out now. At first, when it all happened, and I had that thought through my head where we're not going to make it, and it's, it's not right, it's too hot, and we can't breathe. But then as the shelter was over our back, it was like, hey, I can breathe again, and we were getting out, we were able to move now. So it was a lot easier and had more confidence, and I knew we'd be okay. And just being right next to each other, I kept looking at Frank, and just we'd look at each other and then keep moving. And same with Roberto, we'd all look at each other, and we couldn't hear anything, but just knowing each other are right there and you're not by yourself and you have someone right there with you. So that was a big help too, just knowing that you're not doing it by yourself. We probably made it back to right in here before we were all thinking, okay, it's time to get down, it's getting really bad. So we, um, I made it down to my knees and I heard get in. So I quickly laid down and then realized I didn't recognize the voice and it was, the division chief and he picked us up and uh, we ended up back at the engine fountain Chris was there we um, we, were, we were looking for him as we were backing out we were really glad to hear that he is at the engine once we got out and I seen them come out uh, of the smoke and I was just, I was in total relief by then because I seen all three of them sitting in there what scared me the most is uh, when they came around the truck and I can see that they were burned I didn't say anything to him, so I didn't want to make him freak. And uh, a couple of them jumped in the truck. 
and uh, I seen Bert kind of walk off a little bit, and then he asked me to to take his uh, his gear off. So I took his gear off. Then uh, that was it. We went and seen the medic and the line medic that was right down the road here, about a half mile, and then he told us to get to uh, to ICP, and we went down there and they got treated and they took him down, took him away in the ambulance, and that was pretty much it.